Well, as you know, the, one of the conclusions of the conference at Bali was to promote <coughs> discussions on Kyoto too, and in which I think that the British government played a, a leading role. Uh, and I think that when you come to dealing with climate change, there is nothing more potent than example. And we have to have good policies of our own if we're going to tell other people that they must have good policies too. And so on the British side, I think the, the, the climate change bill, which is now going, going through Parliament, which will create an independent monitor of uh, respect for targets, is very important. Within the European Union, very similar work is being done at the moment, and um, we shall see really quite strong action being taken in, in that regard. So I think in, in the, the you really want example is the most important thing that we can do at the moment. And this year, 2008, we'll see whether the government is ready to rise to its responsibilities. At the moment, I don't have to tell you there are a lot of contradictions and inconsistencies in what is being done. I often think the first is that we get encouragement on, why, on one hand to use, use new kinds of electric light bulbs while we're busy building new runways and, uh, for aircraft, which is certainly a rising source of pollution in, in the atmosphere. So somebody's got to reconcile these different things. When you come to the United States, you find that the situation, again, is changing very fast. In the west, Arnold Schwarzenegger in California, and in the, south and in the northeast states, uh, Massachusetts um, and the others around there, you find that they are already being very concerned about climate change because they can see how much it's going to affect them. But perhaps more important in the, in the electoral stakes in the United States is the interest of the big corporations in all this. General Electric, for example, has just created what, it, what it, I think it calls, uh, what's it, eco, I forget what the phrase is, anyway, e eco-management. It means, in effect, that, that e ecological considerations will come into every aspect of the work of General Electric. Other corporations are doing the same thing. And I find even in this country, that during the last few months, I've been speaking to representatives of the agricultural industry, of the paper industry, of uh, information technology, and all are extremely concerned about what they think may happen. And what they need at the moment is some measure of guidance and advice, which I'm not always able to give them, but at least they are all very interested. And that is the attitude of a lot of corporate, corporate corporations in the United States. And in addition, uh, whichever, whoever wins the elections in the United States is going to take certainly radically different attitudes towards climate change. Hillary Clinton has already set out her, her shop, and you probably have heard that if John, Mc, John McCain is chosen as Republican candidate, he has been very strong on climate change from the very beginning. So things are changing fast there, and I think that the, there could well be an attempt by the Americans to recover something they think very important which is global leadership in this regard. Um, you've heard, have you, that celebrated exchange at the Bali conference when the representative of Papua New Guinea made a speech towards the end when he said to the Americans, you talk about giving leadership, but if you can't give it, get out of the way. And this brought the house down. And uh, I think that led to a slight change of position in the United States within the next 10 minutes. They didn't like that at all. And anyway, it's all changing. Please, you. Yeah, what's your opinion of nuclear power as a solution to climate instability? Well, that's, I won't say that's a nice question because that's what politicians do. I occupy a rather intermediate position on climate change, uh, on, on nuclear. I, I mean, I don't believe that we can renounce nuclear energy entirely. I think that what we need to do is to set out very clearly the conditions under which we can return to use of nuclear power. And if what those conditions include fairly safe ways, I mean safe ways, of getting rid of radioactive waste and reducing the dangers of proliferation and making nuclear power stations safe. The current debate between those who are frenetically for, for and those who are frenetically against is in many ways rather artificial because whatever happens, we're not going to go back to the technologies of the last 20, 30, 40 years. You may have seen recently there has been a good deal of analysis of the rather unfortunate British attitude towards new development of nuclear power stations, which has left us stuck with a lot of technologies which are already manifestly out of date. There are a whole lot of new technologies which meet some of those conditions I have met. If I were in charge, I would be very keen to put heavy emphasis 
on, on finding the, some solution to the problems of, of disposal of waste. And I've been looking for technologies that don't rely wholly upon the particular isotope of uranium, which is the one in question, which is why I'm interested, for example, in what you may have heard of, pebble bed technology, now being developed in South Africa and China, which uses uranium-238, which is the, as, as you might say, the, the, the fr most frequent isotope of uranium, and not 235, which is that from which you can, which you can draw, make weapon systems. And so it's interesting to develop new technologies and look at the whole nuclear debate in terms of using these new safe technologies. I was very disappointed when I, I ran a thing called the Government Panel on Sustainable Development for something like six years. And during that time, we came out with a proposal for how to deal with, or one way of dealing with nuclear waste, which was to irradiate high-level waste with a particular form of bombardment by neutrons. And you'll be astonished to hear the government's response to this recommendation was to say it's all too expensive. Well, I mean, nothing is more, nothing is cheaper than to find, I mean, nothing is more important than finding a problem to the disposal of high-level nuclear waste. And it was a great pity that that was not followed through. And people may now be following it through. I'm no longer running that particular organization. My job has been taken over by Jonathan Porritt, who runs a thing which has been slightly different from what I did, called the Commission on Sustainable Development. But they have also got into the nuclear debate, of course, and uh, I believe there are strong feelings within that commission on both sides. Indeed, for the first time ever, they had a debate, they had a debate on the subject with a vote at the end of it on what should or should not be done. So my answer to your question is yes, I do not reject nuclear uh, power stations. I think it's a marvelous way of solving energy problems. I'm more interested in the long term, that is to say, using fusion energy rather than fission energy. Hence, I'm a great supporter of what's happening in Kadarash at the moment in France, where there is an international effort to develop fusion technology. I went, I don't want to linger on, but I went last year to a meeting on energy for the next thousand years. And uh, there we thought that nuclear technology of the fusion kind would almost certainly be a substantial source of energy in all parts of the world and fission technology, the kind the argument is about at the moment, will probably be, not, I won't say will have disappeared, but it will be much less important, not least because, of course, the, supply, the world's supplies of uranium are limited. But I think that really the emphasis should be now on, on what might be done at Kadarash in developing these new technologies, which are, of course, substantially different and don't carry the same risks. Now, please, yes, sorry. Did you, yes? Um, following on from another question, point. Down here. Um, isn't it inherent in human nature to be sort of slightly selfish? And isn't aren't our politicians more focused on political expediency? And how can we, as potential leaders of the future, actually accelerate that change and ensure that we're not focused on what's best for us, but indeed what's best for our future generations? Well, I think this is the problem of politics in general: is that um, clearly recommending difficult solutions to politicians is a is an uphill business, as we all know. But I think you have to do it. And as I said, with the, sometimes people will give leadership on the question. I'd like to think some of our politicians will. I've spoken to both uh, David Miliband, now at the Foreign Office, and also to David Cameron on some of these issues. And they're very, you know, they're, they, they, at the moment, are at that stage in life where they're ready to look at new ideas and so on and so forth. Whether they will carry them forward in a positive way, I can't tell you. I don't know.